But as, as I look at the response and our capabilities over this period of time that we're, we're looking at, we've gotten better every time. Um, the level of cooperation that exists in our agency is remarkable compared to where it was at the start. And I think that we have tried um, to work with every agency to identify those impediments that either needed a push or a legislative remedy to uh, overcome that stood in the way of either further collaboration or a quicker response or a more effective outcome. And I, I, I plead with all of you, if there are additional things that you see, having just uh, gone, uh, hopefully, gone through the Ebola, this version of the Ebola crisis, uh, I don't want to be presumptuous, but uh, uh, that are further changes that we need to make, then by all means, uh, make sure that we're fully briefed on what they are. Our attempt is to continue, continue to refine the legislation so that not only is it seamless, uh, it is the most uh, expeditious that we possibly can present. And I understand, especially with Dr. Borio, that there, there's a huge difference between your mission and Dr. Robinson's mission uh, from a standpoint of the core uh, uh, responsibilities of the agency, but all of them have to work together for us to maximize um, the outcome, and that's what we're all after. Dr. Lurie, uh, one of ASPR's duties is set forth by the law is to provide leadership in international programs, initiatives, and policies that deal with public health and, and medical emergency preparedness and response. Yet over the past year, as the Ebola outbreak grew in urgency and attention, the question of who's in charge was once again raised. I'll ask you, uh, what specific steps are you going to take to make sure that the role of the ASPR is clear and fulfilled, consistent with the statutory intent so that there is no future confusion on who is in charge. Thank you, Mr. Byrne. I appreciate your question. I also appreciate all of your letters <laughs> over the, the last few months to be sure um, that we, in fact, um, remembered our authorities and were in a position to leverage every single one of them that we needed to leverage for Ebola. And I believe um, that we did. I'll answer your question in a couple of ways. Um, to begin with, um, you know, within ASPR, uh, we have a, a group that very specifically deals with preparedness for international public health emergencies of different kinds. Uh, our collaboration with other countries, we're the focal point for the international health regulation reporting and others. So, and so we are uh, positioned very much at that interface. Within the, within the department as this unfolded, as I think you know, it unfolded first as uh, a global or an international event in West Africa. And I'll say for starters, it, if anyone ever needed any reminding about what happens somewhere else, is important to uh, U.S. domestic national health security. I hope they need to look no further than this past year um, as any reminder for that. In a complex emergency where multiple department and agencies are involved, as, as you first know, um, the president is in charge, and within the department, the secretary is in charge. Uh, throughout this event, um, the secretary took full advantage of all of the different kinds of roles and expertise um, at CDC, at NIH, at FDA, in ASPR, and VARDA, and beyond. Yeah, let me, let Pulling me, together let me, people let me, every day. Let me yeah. stop you there if yeah. you can. Sure. Because there was tremendous thought put into this as we constructed it originally. Yep. Um, as a matter of fact, you couldn't find anybody to raise their hand and say, I'm in charge when there's a, a problem. Um, I'm in charge. Yeah. We created the office specifically for this purpose. And trust me, I get it. The president's in charge. Yeah. When you get past the president, um, do you remember the weeks and months that we went through of the request by the public and people abroad and people in government going, who's in charge? And, and, and 
there was a point that the White House got to where they appointed somebody who never made a public statement who they said, you're in charge. Uh, when I called the White House and asked who was in charge, they told me another person. The statute of the law says you're in charge because you're Asper. Why was that so difficult for people to understand? One of the purposes of this whole legislation was to map out what we do when something happens. And quite frankly, we got from there down pretty good. And I'm not, this is not critical of you individually. Uh, I have raised this with the secretary. I have raised it with the, the uh, chief of staff at the White House. I have raised it with Lisa Monaco. We tried to recreate a wheel when we had an architecture in legislation already in statute that says, if something happens, here's what we do. Bam, 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 bam. And it disturbs me only from this standpoint that every other mechanism that we put in place worked almost seamlessly. Um, we could make the case, Robin, that maybe we should have had some stuff in the NIH at a more mature state so that there could have already been a handoff. I, I think uh, uh, Dr. Fauci would probably agree with that. It got put on a back burner. Uh, it might be that CDC might have had more uh, assets pre-positioned uh, somewhere in the world, uh, but they responded to it. It may have been that uh, maybe FDA had done further thought about how do we um, uh, expedite a review on things that are critical to um, uh, uh, whether somebody lives or dies, they've done that. But I still get the impression that we're not sold on who's in charge. What so, does it take? So I, I, I take your point. And, you know, we are, as you know, not totally through this event. We still have a lot of action going on in West Africa. We hope we don't have more Ebola cases here, but we are uh, focused and vigilant and prepared. Um, even though we're not yet through, we have already begun both a series of in-process in progress reviews as well as a process for us to step back and look at lessons learned and take corrective actions, um, both within the department. And I think it's fair to say that every part of government that was involved in Ebola is really looking at lessons learned and how to do better the next time. And I will look forward to sharing those and discussing those with you as we move forward. Well, I, I, yeah. I hope you will also raise your hand and say, Absolutely. you know what, I was supposed to, I was supposed to do all this. And as you know, I, I'm, I, hear you. I, I, I thank yes. so much of the secretary. Um, the secretary by design wasn't put in charge because the secretary has all sorts of other things. And, um, for this, I think, to at least be tried, we have to get to the point that we execute what the statute of the law says. And uh, I thank you for the work that you do. Uh, I'll Senator wait for Senator Frankie to come back, but I'll take some time in the interim. Um, in, in fact, to Senator Cassidy's answer, uh, Dr. Frieden went in August, and when yes, Dr. Frieden came back, yes, all sir. of a sudden the request was made. I mean, it, it, triggered, it triggered the director being on the ground it, 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 it triggered somebody in that um, multiple leadership level. And I go back, Dr. Lori, that's why it is so important that there be somebody driving the train. Um, and I, I, I guess I would ask this, Robin, when did the vaccine alarm bell go off? Last summer. Uh, probably in the middle of the summer because we had been looking at a number of different candidates at the NIH, also at DOD, and we went out and uh, immediately uh, we started looking at procuring those and for the development, and NIH and CDC were, were moving forward with uh, putting together the initial cl clinical trials with Walter Reed, which actually then started in uh, September and then October. And uh, we made investments at that time, not only in vaccines, but also uh, in, in August, in fact, that we went forward with ZMAP as a, uh, a major uh, investment for countermeasures. And I, I want to point out, this is, this is why we know what we had in place works, because the alarm bell went off for vaccines before 
Dr. Frieden was on the ground before the request. Dr. Lurie? Yeah, well, so let me, let me provide a little bit more information about timeline and some activities. So back in the spring, as we saw the epidemic unfolding in Liberia, one of the things that I did was pull together all the members of the countermeasure enterprise, uh, including all of HHS, DOD counterparts, DHS counterparts, others, and say, what do we have anywhere in the pipeline? What's buried in there? Let's talk to our international partners. And through that, we identified the two vaccine candidates. We identified ZMAP and some other candidates. And we had a number of enterprise meetings and said, what is it going to take to put our foot on the gas, pick who we think we can get, the candidates we think we can get forward with faster, so that by the time we really sounded the alarm bell, there was already a huge amount of work in progress because now the countermeasure enterprise is working together so well. Um, I will comment, I'm sorry, Mr. Cassidy's not here to do this. Throughout this whole Ebola episode, we have been racing to catch up with FDA. They have, they have been amazing in their speed and their flexibility and their real outreach to work with companies. Similarly, back um, in the spring slash early summer, as we looked at the Ebola trajectory, we said we need to start um, waking up our U.S. healthcare system and preparing them and began um, working with CDC to develop and push out lots of guidance and information. So in fact, while this was still in Africa and the epidemic curve was still going up, Dr. Frieden was on the ground. We were taking many, many steps here in this country to advance our preparedness and to get the countermeasure work going. That's in fact why we've got two vaccines in clinical trial right now in West Africa and a ZMAP trial, which will start any day. Let me, uh, I'm, I'm not gonna be as diplomatic as Senator Cassidy was, because um, I think what he was alluding to, and I, I, I'm not surprised you won't go there, um, was the WHO an impediment? Uh, and I'm not asking, I don't want you to comment on it. Um, the, the fact was that the WHO was the lead on the ground. And uh, CDC, even with great insight as to what the potential was down the road, uh, wasn't in a position to make a decision to trump the World Health Organization. Now, the, the reason I'm less diplomatic and go ahead and mention those three letters, folks, this is something we have to think about. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I was on the phone saying, forget about them, bypass them. Um, when we see the threat as seriously as we did, then we have an obligation to this country uh, to do whatever we need to do in conjunction, and I think this is where we ended up, with the countries affected and not with some uh, health architecture that uh, probably uh, had never modeled uh, something quite like this. And I, I only hope that this is one of the discussions internally that we will have is how do we react next time uh, if in fact we run up against uh, an impediment uh, that, that, that looks like this. Uh, let me just move very quickly. Um, Dr. Borio, as you know, human efficacy studies are not feasible for some medical countermeasures. Therefore, FDA's animal rule is particularly important for such products. The 2013 POPA reauthorization required FDA to finalize guidance on animal rules. Uh, we're coming up on the two-year anniversary of the enactment of POPA, and this final guidance is already past due. When will the animal rule guidance be finalized as required by law? Senator Burr, first I'd like to thank you for bringing this issue up because it's, I share your sense of priority for the animal rule and I sense a sense of frustration for this animal rule guidance not uh, having been completed as of yet. Um, we did issue the revised guidance in May of 2014. The common period closed in August of 2014. Um, and I don't mean this as an excuse, but we have been very engaged with stakeholders on the guidance, as well as providing some additional training, and the feedback we have received is overwhelmingly positive. Having said that, I've also requested um, a timeline and additional action items that are required to bring this to closure, because again, I share your priority, and I'll do everything I can to bring this to closure 
as soon as possible. I appreciate that. Please carry the message back. Uh, we are watching. Um, I'm, my only regret here is that it doesn't take EPA as long to promulgate rules and to uh, put authorizations out as, as it does at FDA. Uh, Dr. Red, less than 24 hours before today's hearing, CDC updated its website to include information on the influenza 4 antiviral uh, that was approved over two months ago and is highlighted in FDA's testimony here today. This countermeasure was supported by BARDA and played a role in the H1N1 response. I'm concerned that in the midst of one of the worst flu seasons in recent memory, it took CDC more than two months to update its website. What took so long? Sorry, I, I can't answer that question directly. I can get back to you with an answer. I think that's uh, two months is a long time. Well, let me say that it, it, get back to us with an answer and what steps, if any, is CDC taking to ensure that this type of delay in providing the most up-to-date and complete information to healthcare practitioners, whether it's in the midst of a flu season or not, um, it, it could be an emerging uh, threat like Ebola. And this would seem like it's a fairly easy thing to try to accomplish, so please take that back. I think it's only appropriate uh, while we're having this hearing that uh, there is a news flash that an Arlington County uh, uh, individual has been uh, taken by EMS, a uh, potential Ebola case. But we've been through that many times and found it to be <laughs> uh, not the case. This uh, is a place, though, where the system now works extraordinarily well. I, and I want people to really understand that. I, I'm yeah. convinced it is, and I think specifically for you, um, I put this out as a thought. At some point, we're, we're going to have to explain exactly how we came up with the hospitals designated to handle, um, because there are a lot of institutions out there that felt they should have been included in that. Um, maybe there are a lot that hoped that they'd never be included in it. And um, uh, I think a question for another day. Okay. Given what we know today about the amount of contaminated waste that had to be delicately taken care of, when we say this hospital has the capacity for 10 Ebola patients or 10 infectious disease patients in the future, yet we look at the capacity to dispose of the waste, meaning two patients, haven't we done an injustice by suggesting we've got 10 beds when we've only got two beds that we can fill and adequately take care of that? Uh, I, I, I know this is going to trigger a lot of things for you. It is, and I, I both look forward to, has Folsom a discussion you would like about the strategy, about designation, and the way we've approached Congress's request to have a regional strategy going forward? I actually feel that it's quite sound. Um, I think, Senator Casey, you really talked about the importance of science-based decisions. And clearly, at the beginning of this, there were some things we didn't know about the science, um, but it also got, uh, as I think we've all pointed out, very confused with the fear and other factors. Yes, a, a hospital that is an Ebola treatment facility has to be able to handle waste. But we also know that there are facilities in this country that handle waste all the time, including things like deactivated chemical weapons from Syria or the Middle East that were unwilling to take incinerated, not infectious ash from an Ebola patient. So we have to put some science behind this and some rationality behind this. As we solve the problem, it's an area where my office has been working very closely with CDC, with EPA, the Department of Transportation, and we'll have some good solutions going forward. Well, I, I appreciate that. Let me just make this comment that I, can, I was telling Senator Casey uh, when others were asking questions. I can still remember uh, Senator Mikulski and I going through tabletop uh, exercises prior to writing the legislation and how many times we got to a point where you looked around the table and the question was, who's in charge? And nobody had an answer to it. That's why most of what went into BARDA was the direct result of going through and gaming these things out and knowing the difficulty. So, you know, I hope that the after action process that is initiated from 
this exercise in Ebola, regardless of which agency it's at, is that we're sitting down taking those things that we now know are difficult, we now know are, are insightful for the public, and we're figuring out a way uh, to structurally make sure that we've either minimized them or eliminated them for the next round of this because uh, that's absolutely important and I would tell you it starts right at the top. It's somebody securely being in charge of the whole process right from the beginning. Yeah. And, and let me, let me t make two comments. Number one, that has already begun. I've taken responsibility for this review process. We already have a long list. Some of these corrective actions are already in progress and I'm sure we will surface more. Um, along the way. Good. I also don't want to leave you or anyone else with an impression that this whole response hasn't been coordinated. Okay, I want, I mean, I want you to be well, really I feel, clear. I feel confident okay. that it has been, okay. but please do understand. I understand. That when, when I call six different places, one of them being the White House, and nobody can answer the question of who's in charge, I have every legitimate reason to sit up here yes. and question at what point was there one person who was moving the pieces and making the request? And um, I, I'm, I'm hopeful yes. we won't have that problem again. But that was my most recent experience, and it became very personal because I thought we did a very good job of stating in the statutory language exactly how it was. Because you are the papa and the grandpapa, yes. Robin, as you know, Barta <laughs> intentionally has a very specific and targeted med medical countermeasure mission. And this is to ensure that BARDA is staying focused on bringing forward the medical countermeasures we need to protect the American people from a range of chemical, biologic, radiological, and nuclear threats. The statute that governs BARDA is clear on the focus of this mission with all of BARDA's work being tied to this threat context. I understand that concerns about increasing resistance to certain antibiotics in, in, in just this week, there have been reports of an antibiotic-resistant superbug surfacing in North Carolina. Clearly, antibiotic resistance is a significant public health concern. However, I want to take this opportunity to clarify that BARDA's work in this area is tied to its overall work to advance medical countermeasures against CBRN threats and not outside of this context. Um, would you please take a moment and explain why BARDA is working to bring forward broad spectrum antibiotics to address the CBRN threats we may face and why it's so important that BARDA's mission mm -hmm. not be diluted by matters or mandates that would require BARDA to work on areas outside of those tied to threats um, we have discussed uh, here today? Certainly we have a material threat assessment and determination from Department of Homeland Security that says antimicrobial resistance could occur in these bio threats, like anthrax. So that is a threat for us, and that was the impetus for us in 2010 moving forward. We're developing new classes of antibiotics that would be able to address antimicrobial resistance in bio threats. So I want to make really clear where we are on this. Our mission was primarily for bio threats. It will remain there with these development of antibiotics. They will have uh, benefits for other high priority community pathogens. In fact, we see one of the drugs that we have been developing, plasomycin, that has been working for a number of different bio threats, is actually uh, being used, uh, can be used for CRE and uh, may be actually being used in the uh, outbreak in UCLA hospitals. Saying that, uh, uh, our funding for broad spectrum antimicrobials, because there are a number of those different pathogens that are in our bio threats, uh, we want to make sure that uh, we have coverage of theirs. There are several Burkhardero species that cause glanders and meliodosis that we have drugs, but they certainly could be made much better, and we want to make sure for just wild type, not antimicrobial resistant, with, that we have wild type, that we can address those wild type pathogens, have better drugs for that. And so that's the main impetus of this. But we certainly want to make sure that the benefits that we have in those investments can be made for multiple indications that can help public health too. Dr. Redd, as, as you and your colleagues at CDC and BARDA know, it's very important to make sure that BARDA and CDC are coordinate, coordinating on strategic national stockpile needs so that we're bringing forward medical countermeasure candidates that will meet the identified requirements. 
there are a few mechanisms by which HHS can produce countermeasures. For example, BART is responsible for executing the BioShield Special uh, Reserve Fund, which is used to procure security countermeasures in the strategic national stockpile. And CDC also receives funding to manage the strategic national stockpile, including replenishing expired products. How is CDC transparent to stakeholders regarding what opportunities may exist to be considered for the strategic national stockpile outside of the BioShield procured product? Uh, yes, sir. There are a couple of ways that we do that. First, on the internal coordination, I mentioned the um, public health emergency medical countermeasure enterprise where the, uh, the strategic national stockpile budget is reviewed and recommendations are made. So there's internal coordination, particularly between BARDA and, and CDC. Uh, the um, the multi-year budget that I believe uh, this committee requested is part of making that future, uh, the future needs apparent. And I think that was just released within the last, uh, the last few weeks, but that would be a way of forecasting what the future requirements would be. Let me ask you, how does the handoff occur for products that may have been procured or received from BARDA uh, and advanced research and development funding, but are now procured by BioShield, but could still be potential stockpiled yeah. candidates? I think in general, uh, when, a, when a product is licensed, it moves into um, the strategic national stockpile responsibility app and app that there may be a first uh, delivery through BioShield, but then it's transferred to the strategic national stockpile responsibility. 